Welcome to the Keith B. Dixon Zone, dropping photography knowledge all day long. Right? 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 Yes, yes, yes. I just love that intro, you guys. I really do. Welcome back to another broadcast podcast of the Kilo Bravo Delta Zone. It's official. You are in the Keith B. Dixon Zone. If you are a returning listener and or subscriber, thank you for your support and encouragement. If you're new to this podcast, welcome. Either way, thank you for listening. I appreciate you. My goal on every podcast is to provoke thought and action. Thought and action, those are the two things. That's my primary mission for every single broadcast that I produced. Before we get started, let me give you some backstory on Terry. Terry White is a Detroit native and the founder of the Mac Group, which is one of the largest Mac Group users in Michigan. Terry is a Photoshop Hall of Famer, a recipient of the Exposure 101 Legends Award, and he has close to 395,000 subscribers on YouTube. That is phenomenal all in itself. He's a worldwide speaker, author, and evangelist, mentor, my friend, Terry White. Terry, how's it going? It is going amazing. I'm so glad. I, I, I want to thank you for for coming out. I know your schedule is tight, and uh, you're a busy guy as usual. You just got back from Iceland. I did. How, how was that? Iceland is always great, at least the two times I've been there. Wow. So this was uh, no different than last time, other than going to different places. The weather cooperated. The weather was amazing, of course. I always tease them and say, I brought this from Atlanta. I'm taking it back with me when I leave. And sure enough, the week after, it was rainy and cold. And Man, you are inspiration really when it comes to travel, <laughs> let me tell you. Oh, I, I, again, uh, like I tell any photographer, it's, you know, anyone can learn the settings and the gear and you buy the gear. I said, but after that, it's about what you're photographing. If you go to, if you want to photograph your backyard versus going somewhere, it won't be as impactful. Oh, I can definitely see that. So look, let's let's get some backstory on you because a lot of people they know you, but they don't really know you. And let's let's do a little backstory. So you grew okay. up in Detroit. Tell I us did. about that. Uh, born and raised in Detroit. Um, lived in Michigan all my life until 2014, and then I moved to Atlanta. So grew up on the east side of Detroit. So, Define the east side for us, because that sound you we say east, you know, we're thinking like okay, that's well, like, well, yeah, let's just say the east side didn't have a lot of prosperity. Oh, there we go. We'll okay, put it that way. All right, kind of like East Oakland. Yeah. I'm from there. All right, I get you. It was the hood. All right, and then you were in, so you've you've done service for the country. You were in the I was in which the military branch? from Army, uh, actually Army National Guard from eighty two to eighty eight. Six what years. what uh, what area? Um, military police. What? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I wouldn't have never. Oh wow. Okay. And then so you're living in in Atlanta right now. I am. And and what what prompted Detroit to Atlanta? What? Weather. Weather. Yeah. Tired okay. of snow and cold. Snow and cold. Yeah. And and how's that? And then your tell you telecommute like work wise like how? Do yeah, you I work I work from home, so I work remotely. Okay. And. Tell me about tell me about Adobe. Like, how long have you been there? What is that? How did that How did that happen? Give us the backstory on Adobe. I'll be celebrating my 21st anniversary Wednesday. Wow, that speaks a lot to the culture. So, 21 years, same place. Wow. And then your official title is Adobe Evangelist. My official title is Worldwide Design and Photography Evangelist. Wow. Actually, Principal Worldwide Design and Photography Evangelist. Okay. And in those 21 years at Adobe. Um, paint a picture for us about progression and I mean how do you how do you stay at a company 21 years in this day and age especially technology is just unheard of and then number two how, what would you attribute your success to as, as being a worldwide evangelist how do we get to that point um, well for me before Adobe any job I stayed on I usually didn't stay on for more than two years because simply because I was just bored like I would You know, you get into a job, you learn a job, and then after a year or two, then it's just you're doing that job every day. And Adobe was the first company I ever worked for that I never got bored because there was always something new coming or there was always something new to learn or always something new to do. And so that's how I was able to manage staying in one place for 21 years because even to this day, there's always something new on the horizon. There's always something new to play with. There's always something new to keep me interested and keep me going. 
So when you were hired on, what was your official capacity? My official capacity was what we used to call a market specialist. So I came on um, from my knowledge of both Photoshop and, at the time, PageMaker. Oh, I remember PageMaker. Yeah. yeah. And so you were around, around. Uh, were you uh, at Adobe around version 5.0, was that, or were you before 5.0? 5.0 of which one? Uh, Photoshop. Oh, I was at Adobe. When I came to Adobe, we were on version, it must have been version 3 at the time I switched oh. to, uh, went to work for Adobe, because yeah. I started with 2.5, and then shortly thereafter, Photoshop 3 came out, and I think that was around the time I went between 3 and 4. Wow, man, that's, I mean, five for me was like, whoa, this is a big product. Well, three was the big one because before three, there were no layers. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, that was a big deal, man. And, yeah, so three was huge. And then did you see yourself being ingrained in a company for 21 years? Or? No, no one sees that. Okay. No one's, you know, no one at that age especially says, you know what, I'm going to be here for 21 years. <laughs> Nobody says that. Nobody thinks that. It just, next thing you know, it's been 21 years. Describe the Adobe culture for us because I got and, and, and I'm going to be a little biased here. Usually I try to be unbiased. I love Adobe products. I love the chances they, they've taken in the industry. What's the culture like? Like reel me in here. The culture is always fast moving from a product. And, and I know it, it may not feel that way to everyone, but from a product and acquisition and direction standpoint is fast moving. The day to day doesn't always feel fast moving. As a matter of fact, it's like things never get done fast enough sometimes. Um, but as a company, it's it's exciting to always see what the engineers are working on, what the next direction will be, what the next product will be. Um, and of course, acquiring companies to help us be stronger in, in various areas that we need to be stronger in. So the culture is there's always something new and always new people. Because with those acquisitions, oftentimes comes the workforce from that company. So uh, when I started with the company, we were, I want to say, three, 4,000 employees. Now we're 12,000. So it's funny to, you know, I don't get to come out to California as often as I used to. But when I'm here walking through the halls and just, I don't know anybody anymore because right. you know, a lot of the people I started with are not there anymore. And all the people that are there now are new to me. Wow. You know, when I think of Evangelist for Adobe, you know what two names come to mind? You and Julianne Cost. Yes, Julianne's awesome. Why is that? I mean, wh why do you guys stand out in the company? Well, probably from your standpoint, you know us because we're the two that handle Photoshop and photography. Uh, there are other evangelists like Jason Levine, who handles video, uh, Paul Tranny, who does graphic design and web. Uh, but you, you will know those names if those were the areas you primarily dealt with. Uh, Julianne has been around for about as long as I have. Either she's been there a little bit longer or a little bit less than I, I can't remember. But we've been there about the same amount of time. Um, and she started off in tech support. Wow. So she's really kind of grown. Yeah, so grown. she's grown quite a bit. And just for our listeners so they'll understand what it's like to work at a company like that, is there someone standing over your shoulder saying, hey, Terry, you got to do this every day or do you have free will? What's what's going on? Um. Yes and no. <laughs> like no, there's no one. I, I like no no one's micromanaging my schedule. So, um, I do have that flexibility in making decisions on what I think should be done at any given time. And it and more so probably in the past than now because there are you know certain guidelines and things that we have to stick to nowadays more than we used to. Um, but I do have. I'm responsible for reporting on what I'm doing, and therefore there are people watching those reports, and if I don't hear anything, then that must mean everything's okay. Oh, man, that's awesome, man. So it's really, it's like being an entrepreneur, but with the support of a major company. Would you describe it that way? Sort of, okay. in the evangelist realm, because uh, in a lot of cases you are setting the direction on what, uh, what like for example, so, you, know, you, you will know what the focus will be. Like, hey, the focus is going to be Adobe Stock or the next version of Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever. and then But then it's up to you to define who and what and where you should be talking about those things. Oh, wow. Okay. And to get you to the point where you are, I mean, you're, you're definitely a legend. There's no question about it. I could argue that, you know, with anyone. Um, 
how do you foresee, you know, what's coming down the road? Why are you so good at it? Can you just tell us what the secret is to that? Don't sleep. Uh, <laughs> see, there's a, there's a common yeah. connection. Yeah. Um, you just really have to stay on top of industry, the industry trends, not only what's going on in your company, but what's going on in the world. So you have to stay on top of what people are interested in, what people are doing, um, because that's, at the end of the day, what any company is, really, to be successful, you have to not only um, come out with great products and services, but you have to predict what people will need by the time you can develop it. So, you know, the, you have to have your eye on where, where the ball will be, not where it is right now. You know, um, back in 2015, I achieved this worldwide ranking as an influencer in the cloud-based space, mostly with Netgear products and storage. That's awesome. um, as I, I see the Netgear box on your desk uh, there. Everywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, everything's Netgear, right? Um, when, when you think about cloud space, uh -huh. when you first, when Adobe says, hey, we're, we're going to make everything subscription-based, we're going total cloud-based, you know, what was going through your mind at the time? Were you thinking, you know what, mm, that's a little risky. I don't know. I better start getting my resume together or this is genius. I'm I about to hit the market. Actually, I never, I never really thought about it in either way, like either extreme. Like I wasn't worried and I wasn't thinking, oh, my God, this is going to you know, change the world. It was kind of like, OK, once I heard the direction and the direction was explained to me, I said, OK, that makes sense for us as a company to do this. Now, of course, with any major change, no matter what it is. You will have customers that will cheer it. You will have customers that will be you know, storming the gates with pitchforks. So when you make such a monumental change to switch from the way people have been used to buying their products for 15 years to now you're going to buy, you're going to own, or not, you're not going to own your license. You're going to subscribe to a license this way from now on. That will definitely create some turn and consternation in people's minds and hearts and wallets and everything else. Um, when you have people that have traditionally, for uh, as long as they can remember, they've always just, you know, either gone to a store or, and picked up a box of software or they've ordered, you know, a disc or a download, and now you're telling them, nope, that's going away, and now you will, um, you will only be able to get this software as if you join and, and pay a monthly fee. Well, obviously, you're going to have some people that think that's horrible and a bad idea, and you're going to have some people that get it. Um, but what people fail to realize or, or think about is that, you know, because we always think about just us. We don't think about everyone else. You think about yourself, self-centered. Um, you have people that were never able to afford $799, $999, $1,500 for a suite. Great point. $2,499 for a suite. And they were like, wait, let me get this straight. I can pay you $50 right now. And I can have everything, including Lightroom. I can have Premiere. I can have After Effects. I can have Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Dreamweaver, and Cloud Storage. Wait, wait, wait. And I just got to give you $50 a month. That's all I got to come up with. Yep, that's Unbelievable. it. Unbelievable. Right. So there's always two sides to the coin. People that were pirating, maybe in some cases, that felt bad about it. You know, some people like are, don't have any shame; they don't care. Right. But there are a lot of people that that owned or had a pirated copy that they didn't want to steal, that and was, now that was able that was their chance to be legitimate. That was, you know, I got to tell you, that was a defining moment. But you know what was really impressive? Because I, I was following you in some of the Adobe communities, and and people were just going in. I mean, you know, the the internet bullying and the trolling that was mm -hmm. going on behind this decision. The one thing that I, and I'm going to tell you, this was a, a big thing for me. The way you handled it, I thought was beyond professional. Um, you know, even when they made it personal, like Terry, you're this, uh, I mean, you just, I mean, you were the ultimate professional, even in your responses. And I gotta tell you, that was a big thing for me. Cause I was like, this guy, you know, he's, well, you didn't, you didn't see the first draft of the response. There's always right, what yeah, you type right, and then right. it's delete, 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 delete. Right. Okay. Let me type this again. Oh, uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right. Like, I'm, uh, uh, but, yeah. Or let me wake up and respond to that tomorrow. But yeah, that was, you know, that was really good, man. I, I that's what I looking at. Now, I got to tell you, you know, I, when I was in college, I majored in organizational communication. So seeing that play out was critical for me. Well, the, the thing you have to understand is when people are upset and they're typing out of anger, usually, you have to let them have their emotion. 
You know, whatever you say is not going to change that emotion right off the bat. That's a good point. So let them have their emotion, and then now let's talk about why you have this emotion. So one other question related to this. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to phrase the question like this. Should photographers be in the cloud space? Well, it's just like anything else. If you plan to continue to be relevant, then you you have to evolve with your tools. Ooh, good answer. That's good just answer. like saying, if you if we go back, should you shoot digital? Yes. You can have that same argument. I like that. I like that tie into relevancy. Right. So, and, and how many film shooters are relevant anymore? It's a good point. I, so, I same thing. <laughs> if you plan to continue to stay relevant, then you have to evolve with your tools. That is tearing. See, legendary answer, right? Well so, rehearsed. <laughs> so, look, I, I I heard some disturbing. I, I I read and heard a disturbing interview with Sheryl Sandberg. She's the CFO of Facebook, okay. and I was disturbed because we work so hard at what we do. It automatically creates a brand. And I'm a firm believer in, you know what? Your clients will tell you whether or not you're a brand mm -hmm. because they will refer to you a certain way. They will respect you a certain way. And it just, you're, it's like you just get grandfathered into a situation. Right. Um, Sheryl Sandberg basically said, if you're not like a Colgate, a Nike, or a major corporation, that you're really not a brand. But let me say this before you before you go on, and I say but because I don't believe I don't believe that for a second. Um, when I look at when I look at Terry L. White, I look at Terry L. White as a brand. I've seen your social, I've seen how you engage your community, and you're probably one of the few people that I know that could really just put his name on something and it just takes off. Would you consider yourself a brand? Do you agree with Sheryl Sandberg? Well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat something you just said. I don't consider myself a brand, but other people do. So then, therefore, I probably am. But I've never I don't call myself a brand. Uh, and no, I don't agree with her. Um, now we could make the argument, or she could make the argument. You might not be a major brand, but that doesn't mean you're not a brand. Because when I think of just the term brand. Uh, let's take, you know, I just left a Marriott hotel. If you see the name Marriott, what comes to mind is what you would expect when you walk in the door, whether it's the cleanliness or the, the, you know, there's always a snack bar on the left-hand side of, you know, of everyone. There is always, you know, this room type or whatever it is, that's what you expect from that brand. So when you think of a person, and if they're if they reach the stat or the status of being considered a brand by all their followers or by you know peers or whoever, then when you see that name or logo, there's an expectation of what's going to come next. So if I see Keith B. Dixon, and oh, I'm about to see some great photos. You know, in other words, that's what I'm saying. So that's that's your brand, because you've established yourself, you've established a name, you've established a brand, basically that denotes an expectation of what's to follow. Wow. Cheryl, if you're listening, I, I know you're probably not. But, <laughs> hey, I, I love you. I love what you guys have done, but um, got to respectfully disagree. Yeah. So um, I, I would disagree that, you know, that, uh, that just because you're not a major brand, therefore you're not a brand. But, you know, uh, yeah, she would have to make that, she would have to change that argument a little bit for me. So... Help me with this contrast. This is a big contrast that I've never seen before, only because I've had friends who were police officers. Mm -hmm. How do you make the transition from military police to technology? Where where did that come from? Well, Explain. it was really not a transition. Even when in the military police, or even in when, when I started, I was the first one to bring a Mac into the unit. So I was sitting there with a Mac 128 doing things that used to be done on paper. So there, the technology was always there. Wow, that's interesting. So, you have let me or Mac five twelve at the time. Let me frame this up. Um, so you have this ability to see how technology can be applied. Like, help us define that. Like, how do well, you? Well, I think my my two greatest um, assets are a the ability to take technology and, and easily understand it than than many. And secondly, the ability to turn that around 
and explain it. So those were, I would say, would be my two greatest strengths when it comes to technology. Um, so to, to just see a problem or see something being done one way and say, okay, how can I apply technology to that? That's one of my strengths. Okay, wow. So is that true for everyone? Or is that something you can develop? Is it uh, something you can train for? How do we how do we become the next Terry White? I know uh, it's a tough question. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's so. Because, you know, it's, it's just like saying to uh, Michael Jordan, can anyone learn to, to, to play basketball like you? And I, I, Yeah, I guess. But if that's something you were, you were born with, it's hard to say can anyone else have it. I'm sure someone else can. I don't know how you would learn it. But I can't just easily say, oh, yeah, anyone can do it. Because I don't know if you how you are if you didn't already have it. That makes a lot of sense, and let's let's go a different direction. Let's change. I like to call it us. Let's do a sidebar. Okay. So we're on, we're getting serious here, and we're digging in. But let's let's do a sidebar. Um, let's talk about speaking. I mean, it's it, when you look out into a crowd because you're you're a worldwide speaker as well. Yeah. I mean, and you've spoken on platforms around the world. Where are some of the cities you've spoken in? Like exotic. Uh, Singapore, uh, Mumbai, India. Um... London, of course, um, Stockholm, Sweden. Um, just think my way around the world. Um, Hong Kong, China. Um, Australia. Uh, the Netherlands. Uh, South Africa. Johannesburg. Um, just about everywhere. So, what has it been like? And, and let me set this. Let me set this up the right way. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to say that you are the reason I, I've, I actually got into live streaming. Um, you were the very first person to follow me on Periscope and I can remember we're at Photoshop world. Yeah, like, I heard Keith, asking you, you, Keith, you got to do this. You got to do this. And you gave me some inspiration and I, and I, I took that as liquid gold. You took it and ran with it. You've been right. doing it more than me. Right. So, um, and I've, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot from watching you. My whole first year of live streaming was built on literally everything you said. I'm not exaggerating because usually I try to get three sources, but I was like, this guy knows it better than anybody. So I'm going to follow him. Being a person of color, presenting yourself to not only just a, a, the, the United States demographic, but to the whole world, what has that been like? You know, it's it's one of those things where – it's funny you, you bring up the color thing because I, I honestly, when I'm out speaking, I don't think about it until it's brought to my attention, either through a comment or through, um, usually through a comment, through just just an observation. Like I don't think about it when I'm on stage, and so it's it's not something I really have had a problem dealing with. Uh, usually, it's something someone else will bring up, and I was like, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> I didn't think about it. You, I'm going to make an argument, and I'm going to say that it really doesn't matter. Because, no, it doesn't. Because if you if it did, you wouldn't be the worldwide evangelist. It's correct. Could we could we agree on that? We can agree on that. So it, it's almost like a false perception. Well, yeah. I mean, there are there's going to be racism and uh, negativity no matter what you're doing and where you go. Um, usually, especially lot when you're speaking live. Um, rarely is it brought to your brought no it goes on your face with it right it's usually usually it's subjective and it's behind the scenes um it's more it's only been more the case when since we've been doing all this live streaming and people can be anonymous right uh that's yeah and i, I think people are just you know in anything people are going to always hide behind something right. you know it, it, that makes a lot of sense and when you're going on stage what what's the biggest crowd you've ever spoken to over uh, five or six thousand people keynoting the Adobe Max. Wow, were you nervous? Like, tell us about uh, you're going on stage. I am. Timid. I am never. I'm, oh, I shouldn't say never. I am usually not never. I, I should not never. I'm usually not nervous with anything to do with the audience. I don't want to mess up in front of peers and colleagues and management. So that. That engagement was entrusted upon me by the VP at the time. And it's like, I don't want to screw this up in front of him. So that's 5,000 people out there I don't care about. 
Right. <laughs> I cannot God, yeah. mess up in front of this guy. And would you practice your, your presentation? Oh, yeah, yeah, always. I learned that the hard way. Uh, quick story. I remember um, one of my early speaking engagements at Photoshop World. I, was doing, I had a couple classes, and it was Photoshop World Orlando. I'll never forget it. I was, I'm, I was like passing Scott Kelby in the, in the elevator area. I was like, where are you headed? He's like, I'm going up to my room. I got to practice my class. I'm, I, I literally lean back like, you need to practice your class? Like, you know this inside and out. Of anyone, I would be thinking you'd be the last one that would say, I need to go practice. Oh, no, no. The night before, I always go through everything to make sure everything works, all my notes, everything, for every class I ever do. I was like, you know, I was like, huh, wave my hand, have fun, I'm going out, you know, going to party, you you go study. And of course, what do you think happened with me the next day? Oof. Files not there that I thought were there, fonts not installed that I thought were installed, just everything, every little thing that could go wrong with that class went wrong. And I'm just kicking myself saying, had I just walked through everything in my room, this wouldn't be happening right now. Wow. So from that point on, I've always at least gone through the material. I wouldn't say necessarily word for word practice of speech or anything, but I go through all the files to make sure everything works. You know, Scott Kelby, I've, you know, I, I'm good at modeling. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing I've learned. If you want to be su successful and then ultimately progressive, because I think success is just kind of day to day, temporary things. But progression is something that you achieve over time. It leaves a crumb trail. And there are, there are certain people that I model. And I've been following Scott Kelby, you know, forever. Um, he's built what I'd like to call an empire. Yep. I mean, he's he's really good. Mm -hmm. um, he's just great at innovating. And and what's the, the what's that word we we used earlier? Um, relevancy. Right. Yeah. He's just. Really, he's always staying relevant. He's always staying relevant. He's one of the most published photographers uh, in, in terms of books in the world. Correct. Um, you guys are really good friends, right? Correct. So do you guys get together and say, hey, you know, do you brain trust together? Like how All the time. Okay. Yeah, we talk just about on a daily basis. How important is that? Extremely, because we're always bouncing things off each other. So would you say, because I got to go into my sidebars, you know, that, yeah. that's what I do. <laughs> would you say that birds of a feather flock together and that's important? Usually. Um, and also the, the same thing goes for, that's always being said that if you're the smartest person in the room, you need to find a new room. Right. <laughs> so I, I could easily hang out with people that know less than me. What will that do for me? Mm. So let's, let's do a deep dive. I want to do a deep dive. In building the Bomb Squad community, oh my God. It has come with uh, battle scars, yeah, I know. stab wounds, and just everything. People keep, uh, uh, you know, I just, I don't like you. Uh, but one uh, thing I've noticed about you is the same thing. You keep going, yes. no matter what. And, and what advice would you give somebody that's starting a community? I know you said keep going. What would you, because I know you've been through the same thing. We've talked about this. What advice would you give somebody who... Stay focused on the reason why you're building that community and don't let anything distract you from it. Yes, and you guys have heard that. You, you just heard it. I mean, it, it, it's going to be tough. People aren't going to like you. Is this true? That's, oh, absolutely. Right? People don't want to see you do better than them. <laughs> so, And they don't want to see you necessarily succeed if they're not. So they would rather, you know, mis this old saying, misery loves company. They would rather you be just as miserable as they are. So when you talk to Scott, just tell him, Keith said, thank you. I, appreciate <laughs> I will let him know. I appreciate him very much. And... Um, you know, it's real, it's real funny. Um, when I got into this this whole photography thing, the, I don't know if you know this, but the very first photographer that I knew about was Joe McNally, mm -hmm. whom I talk, who I talked to. He's uh, one of my mentors and people I look up to. Oh, man, I love Joe. And, um, you know, I try to give him a call every mm -hmm. now and again. And um, I can remember seeing a speed of light video, and that became my whole fundamental process of creating photography and how I was going to do it. And um, he said that one thing, uh, he said this one thing in a speed of light video, the process, you know, will make you some, and I'm interpreting this a more profitable photographer using the Nikon creative lighting system. Yeah. And that really resonated with me because I thought about, I need to be efficient as a photographer. Mm -hmm. When I saw you, I saw uh, process workflow, good use of technology. Um, you guys see, I don't know if you know this, but 
you were, and I never said this, but you became a mentor to me. If somebody said, who's your live streaming? Who's your technology mentor? I'm going to say Terry White, hands down. I never told you that. Yeah. If someone came up and said, Keith, who's your photographer, mentor? How, I'm going to say Joe McNally, yeah. and I'm going to name a couple. How important is a mentor? Very. Um, because even if that mentor doesn't know you, you know, someone you just look up to and you try and, you know, be more alike. Um, it's important to always have somebody that you're trying to be as good as, or if not better, because it keeps you challenged. So when I look at Joe's work, I'm like, first of all, I'm always blown away. And I'm like, how does he do it? How does it? And I got the same camera. I got <laughs> all right, so right. obviously it's not gear. It's, right. it's certainly talent. Um, and I, I'm joking if Joe ever hears this, he knows because I've said this to him many times to his face, is that the one talent that Joe has that I, I don't, and I don't know if I ever will, but I've seen him do it live. Joe can walk up to a perfect stranger on the street, and next thing you know, it's a photo session. Like, he walk up, I, I've seen him do it to the point to where I'm sitting there scratching my chair thinking, was this staged? We were at a workshop in the middle of nowhere, Traverse City, Michigan, on a cold, cloudy, rainy, foggy morning in Lake Michigan. You couldn't see, or whatever lake it was, you couldn't even see the water. That's how bad it was. So it was like a total waste of time. Up comes from the beach this guy walking with a surfboard. He was out there morning surfing. Next thing you know, Lights around him, a crowd around him. Joe's giving the class, taking pictures of this guy. Guy signs a model release, whole nine yards. Image ends up in his portfolio. And I'm like, I could have never, ever approached that guy and oh. said, can we take your picture? Yeah, it would have went right by me. Right. No, I, yeah. I just, and he will turn any situation into a photographic opportunity. He's an incredible, you know, I can't wait to, because I talked to him about doing a podcast and he was like, oh yeah, I can't wait to get him If you, there. If anyone, any photographer would have walked out that morning and saw what we saw, oh, let's just go back and, and work on images. Because yeah. that day was a waste. It right. was like, there was nothing to photograph. And and he's, one of the things I love about him is he stays relevant. Yeah. You know, because I'm going to use the old guy term, right? You know, we're the old guys in photography. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how do we stay relevant? Well... You know, he's he's a prime example of right. how to and do also it. even if you're the young guy in photography, um, again having those skills of just those pe I call them people skills with Joe, that's not something you're going to learn in a class. That's right. Either you have that's one of those either you have it or you don't. That's right. And that's one that I don't. I would say I don't have. I wish I did. That's no. That's that's a good thing. And do you think people skills are important? As a photographer, like how would you? How if you're gonna shoot portraits, yeah. yes. If you're a travel or you're a landscape photographer, it maybe not. But if you shoot, if you photograph people, yeah, you need people skills. So, so I can work with a model, I can work with a subject all day long. But again, approaching that perfect stranger, and I've seen them do it time and time again, and it just captures some of the most amazing shots because they're candid. They're they're not professionals. They're not used to being behind a camera. And he has a way of making people feel comfortable enough, not only to let him take their picture, but to just capture that emotion that for real, this is not staged. This is how this person really feels. And it comes across in his photos every single time. You know, it's funny. Um, you are actually a photographer. And when I when I first discovered that, I was like, wow, you know, and I started following your work um, mainly. You know how I really found out you were a photographer on Westcott's site. Oh, OK. Yeah. And and, I, and we you know, I started looking through and I was like, Terry is really like doing work on top of everything else. Okay. Like, tell us about that. What do you what do you like to sh photograph as a photographer? I'm a portrait slash travel photographer. So I would say 80 percent portrait, 20 percent travel. Really? Yeah. So. When you're going from city to city, do you have a chance to do that's any? The, that's the only reason I say I'm a travel photographer is because okay. I get to go to places, Okay. so I might as well photograph them. And do you take time out usually? Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Is it mostly landscape stuff? Like, what, what do you photograph? Mostly landscape. Mostly. Um, landscape and tourist attractions. So you've been able to build up a, a really good, I guess, stock collection of photos? Yes. And Now... You know, I got to ask you about I this because I need some yeah. secrets, right? Okay. <laughs> yes, we need to hear it. All right. So 
Um, I noticed lately that you've been really, and, and I'm going to say it's the subtle, like building up your stock and talking about it and mm -hmm. promoting it. And I know it's an Adobe product and mm -hmm. there's a lot of stock services out there, but this one, not, not all of them have Terry White attached to it. Tell us, like, where do you see that going? I mean, because it's been around. I mean, is it worth doing? Like, what's the value? Well, uh, I even before Adobe had Adobe stock, I had attempted to contribute things to iStock years ago. And I did, for the few images I submitted, I did okay. Like, my few images were selling on a regular basis. But the thing that was always a problem for me with iStock or any, any of, and I really get into any of the other places, is that, just the whole process of uploading and keywording and getting images approved. And if you wanted to use a model, you had to use their model release, not just yours. So it just, that was the barrier for me to want to do more. So, of course, Adobe acquires a company called Fotolia about, I don't know, three years ago now, two, year, two three years ago, and uh, created Adobe Stock. And, of course, that becomes one of the products that I'm interested in and focused on. Um, so not only, not only did I want to know it, I wanted to be an example of a success with it. So a lot of what you will see me get into is either for one or two reasons. Either I want to be credible, credible when I'm out talking about it, mm. or I'm interested in it for my own personal uses. So for example... The first time I ever did a Lightroom presentation, Lightroom 1.0, it was at Macworld, I'll never forget it. I was on stage talking about Lightroom, and they had given us this, I can't even remember the photographer's name at, the, at this point, but it was some fantastic like uh, sports photographer's images to work with. We licensed them, we, they were our demo files, we had catalogs, Lightroom catalogs with all these images in it. And, and so I'm on stage showing these, these motocross images that were fantastic and taken by this other photographer and showing how, how you could use Lightroom to work with those images. So at the end of my presentation, there was this guy sitting in the front row. And nice, don't, get, don't, don't think of him being a jerk when, when he asked this question. He was just curious. Um, and I took it that way. I didn't take him as he was trying to just make fun. I took it as he really, just really wanted to know. He said, and he waited till the end, waited till Q&A time. He said, are those your images? And I said, no, those are such and such. And I explained you know, who they were. And I never did a Lightroom presentation again that didn't involve my own images. Oh, that's, yeah. I can because see. at that moment, I didn't feel credible. Right. I didn't feel, like, I'm up here just demoing software at that point. How can I talk to photographers when I'm not showing my own images? It's a really good point. It's a really good point. So that was a, I'm going to be a photographer from here on out if I'm going to show photography tools and show my work. You know, um, I saw you doing a, I think it was a stock shoot, and you had broadcasted, I think, on Periscope. It was, you were in a kind of like a kitchen area, and you had these mm -hmm. two models. Yep. Um, is that something you do on a regular basis? It's, uh, I wouldn't say regular, but I, I do it. Yeah, I guess I would say regular now. It is something I do on a regular basis. And what's the long-term goal? Is it revenue producing? I mean, can we make a living off of it? Absolutely. Um, really? There are people that are making, the top contributors are making six-figure incomes. Really? Yeah. Even in this age? Even of... in this age. You know why? Because that's what they do. In and other words. What type of photos? It, well, I'll get to that in a second. You have to think about it this way, and this is, is something I've taught time and time again ever since I've been teaching Adobe Stock. If you're out there thinking, I want to dip my toe in the water and, and check the stock thing out, I'm going to upload some images and see what happens. If that's your attitude, let me tell you now, you will fail miserably. That's just like saying, I want to lose 10 pounds. I'm going to eat a salad tonight and see what happens. Wow. Tomorrow, hey, I didn't lose anything. Because you got back the results of the effort you put in. So you upload 10, 20, 100 images, you expect to retire off that? So stock is definitely a volume business, and it's something that the people that are making all the money, or the top money, wake up to do every day. That's their job. They don't, And they don't rest on their laurels of, oh, I got 10,000 images on stock, I can rest now. I want 11,000. 
I want 12,000. I want 15,000. They're always uploading new content daily or weekly. What's the three most important things? I want to, I'm listening to this podcast and I'm motivated. I'm excited. I don't know if that's enough, but I'm mm -hmm. gonna, we're gonna, we'll start it with that. What are the three things you would tell someone to, that they need to have or they need to do to get involved in stock? First thing I would say is that most of us already have hundreds, if not thousands of images that are sitting on our drives right now that are probably good enough for stock. Because if you've been shooting for years, you have hundreds of thousands of images. So out of those hundreds of thousands, you probably at least have a few hundred that are stock worthy. Um, so you know, most people will start with uploading what they already have. But right after that, because you're going to exhaust that at some point, you're going to you're going to upload every image that that can be uploaded that is worth uploading and gets approved. Now what? So at that point, you've got to, and even before you get to that point, you need to go out and start. If you're going to take it serious, you need to go out and start sh planning and shooting stock. Wow. So just like you plan and shoot anything else. Well. Here's the thing I always tell people that are resistant or they don't think it pays enough or they, oh, I'm not going to work for that or blah, 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 is that no one said you needed to be exclusive. So if you're making good money with your photography, bravo, you're, you're one of the few. Keep doing whatever it is you're doing that's making you good money. But let's say you get paid to go, let's, let's take a wedding photographer, for example. It's easiest people for people to relate to. Let's say you go get to shoot a wedding in Hawaii. They flew you out there. They paid you good money to go shoot their wedding. And, of course, you're going to focus on that wedding. You're going to give them the best results you can. Are you just going to get back on the – put your camera away and get back on the plane and come home? You're there. Right. Set up some shoots, whether it's portraits or landscapes or whatever, and shoot while you're on the scene for stop. Even if you're capturing the wedding and you happen to just – Point your camera two feet to the left and you see something amazing. Capture it. You can always sort those images out separately. Wow. So you're already putting the time and effort in. Why wouldn't you upload those images to stock? And like I said about the images sitting on your drive, the, the you gave them the 10 they wanted. What about the other 90 that they didn't want? That's a good point. That's a really good point. And that's some really good advice. Um, okay. Here's our last question. I'm going to say, unfortunately, for all of us, because it's not every day I get to sit down and talk to somebody. Who, well, actually, I'm going to, I, I got to, let me, let me deviate. Let me sidetrack. Um, you know, back in, I was in college when this, during 9-11, I was in college. And um, I can remember waking up and, and seeing, you know, like everybody saw the Twin Towers. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had read, I don't know if it was on a blog, but you, you had mentioned you were at Steve Wozniak's house. Steve. Yeah, I, I don't know. For, those, for that unfortunate day, I woke up in, uh, I woke up in my friend's house. I was, in, I, was, I was out in California for Adobe meetings that week, and I came out a little early and spent a couple of days with Steve Wozniak. Well, that, those couple of days earlier were, you know, one of those days was 9-11. And so all I remember... I was in his guest room, and Steve, for those of you who don't know, Steve Wozniak's the co-founder of Apple. And I was in his guest room, and I think it was, I couldn't remember if it was his associate that yelled up, or I had a voicemail. I couldn't remember which I got first. But I think it was the voicemail I got first. It was from one of my, one of my um, team members, one of the guys that worked for me at Adobe. He said, all he said was turn on the TV. And I'm thinking, what could be going on that he wouldn't specify a channel? He wouldn't say what it wow. was. Right, he just said, turn the TV on. So I'm like, whatever this is must be major because it must be on every channel. And then I uh, heard someone yell upstairs, turn the TV on. I was like, okay, I'll turn the TV on. And that was, the first, by the time I turned the TV on, the first tower had been hit, and I watched the second tower get hit. Wow. And I was, and of course, as we all know, history tells it, everything was shut down. All the airports were shut down. Adobe was closed. Like, we, you know, everybody was closing. And so now, I, now I'm now i actually, I, you know, I'm with a friend, but I'm actually stuck. stuck. Yeah. I couldn't go home. I couldn't go home for days. 
Because there was no air traffic. Wow. What? Help us be a fly on the wall. You and Steve see this together. This guy is beyond legendary. Yeah. Steve is the, the most calm, laid back person. Like, he doesn't panic. He doesn't get excited, like, in that way. So he was taking it all in stride. Like, everything will be okay. And I'm I'm not freaking out for my own personal, like, sense, but I'm like, my daughters are in Michigan. And I can't be with them right now. That was what I was thinking. I can't get home. I'm 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 surrounded by luxury. I'm in the most comfortable place I could possibly be in for this to be happening. But that was the last thing on my mind. Wow. The only thing on my mind was I need to get home. Wow. That I, I got to tell you that must have been an experience. I mean, I was it was um it was just an unbelievable time and um for, when I read that story, I just, you know, I thought like, wow, not only is he with, you know, uh, Yeah, like I said. Yeah. I, it wasn't like I was in some hotel and they were like, oh, we're closing. We need to let people in. Other, you know, Because I've been in that situation in a hurricane where they need to let the emergency workers in. So you right. got to find a place to go. Right. I had no problem. I could stay there as long as I wanted to. Wow. But the, the only thing I could think about was I need to leave. Wow. So what's author, photographer, worldwide evangelist, um, exposure? I don't know if you... If you guys are brand new to um, this podcast, Terry is not only a speaker at Exposure 101, but he is an alumni. I mean, you, you, and, and I got to think, I want to thank you because we, you know, usually when exposures go on, there's just so much stuff happening. And, and I want to personally thank you for not only being a speaker, but believing in me and Sean Lee. Um, and, and supporting us. I mean, that was so, in our first year, that was major, man. And I never yeah. really got it. I mean, we talked, yeah. obviously, but I never got a chance to thank you. And this is, this thank you is important because it's on the record. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it, it was, thank you for that. And, um, you know, we honored you with the, the Legends Award. And that was quite the honor. Um, you know, we talk about this, and you, you've mentioned it a few times on this podcast that, you know, I've been a photographer since taking it serious since about 2006, 2007. But that was the first time I'd ever been recognized for photography in that way. Oh, wow. So that was that's what made it more of an honor. Wow. I've been recognized in tech and all kinds of other things, but, you know, awards for all kinds of other things, but that was the first photography award. You know, we didn't... Sean came up with the idea of doing it, and then for everything for us is we got to drill it down. Like, what does this mean? Is this something we're doing every year? And what's the criteria for it? And we really looked at accomplishment. We looked at dedication, and one of the factors was, you know, he's got this, Terry has this huge responsibility as an evangelist, and on the side, he's practicing photography and talking about it and executing it. And, you know, I would look at your images and I could tell, I mean, it was, it was obvious, like he's really studying. And that was one of the, the criteria for us in making that decision. Um, and your contribution as a person of color. I mean, it was literally, um, if someone came up to me and said, Keith, um, we're going to present you with a Legends Award. I'm going to tell you, ah, you know, probably not my time. You know, I'm, I'm not quite there yet. That's how you soon. are. May, I, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you that. <laughs> but, um, I mean, that's what it meant for us, you know, and, and, and to present you with that, it was a big deal for us. Well, it was a big deal for me. So just, and I told Sean this already, but I did not take that lightly. Thank like you. that was, a, that was probably one of the, of all the awards I've ever gotten, that was probably like in the top three. Thank you, yeah. thank you. And I got to tell you, I mean, it, yeah, no, it, I shouldn't say probably. Yeah, it's it, in the it's top, top three. three. Thank you. <laughs> of thank the you. awards I've gotten. And you know, even as a, a photographer, you know, you inspire me, and it's you inspire me as a photographer because I see everything that you're doing, and the photography is on top or additional, and I, and it's 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 a tough thing to do. And when I see you putting all this stuff together and making it work at the highest level, I mean, that's an inspiration. And I, I don't know if you know this, but you are an inspiration to a lot of people. What's Thank next, you. Terry? Where, how do you go any higher? I mean, we're already in outer space. I mean, where are you going? What's what's next for Terry O. White? 
I ask myself that more and more every day, and I, I don't have an answer because if you would ask me 21 years ago, I didn't have an answer. It was just, I'm going to do this thing until something else comes along that I want to do more. Wow. And good, good luck with that one. Yeah, so, <laughs> so far, no, you know, it, uh, it's more like, what am I going to add on? Right. So I've added on the photography. I've added on the live streaming and things like that. So I don't know that there's anything on the horizon that, I'm looking forward to coming up next. Um, Any books? Yeah, I'm always thinking of books. Like, I'm always thinking I need to be, like, there are, like, three or four books I'm, I should be writing right now that I just haven't started. One of the books that I am passionate about writing and getting into is interface design. Mm. Um, one, if you ask me what's one of my biggest frustrations... It's bad, bad UI, bad interface design, bad. I would, agree. I would agree. Just when you know something can be so much better if they move this button over here or if they added this option or this menu or this whatever. And it's whether, I remember the, um, one of the earliest biggest frustrations is when GPS systems first started being put in cars. Like, you used to be able to buy them separately, and you still can't. But when they started becoming standard equipment or they started becoming options for cars, I'll never forget the first one I got that was built into my car. I, I literally would, like, just want to beat the wall and say, I want to meet the engineers that thought this is the way you should enter an address. Right. You obviously never have to do it. Because if you had to do it, you would never make it this way. That, yeah. And so it's little things like that, that that becomes my frustration because I know it could be better. I know this is not the best way to do it. How on earth did you make it this way? No, that makes a lot of sense. I, 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 I can definitely see that. And, and it, it's a, for everything. You look at the back of your camera. You look at the menus. And you're like, oh, like, oh my yeah. God. Yeah. What were you thinking yeah. when you came up with this menu system? Yeah. And, you know, that was the reason why I actually uh, chose Nikon as my platform yeah. because um, of the hierarchical yeah, type of feel right. that it has. But is that Canon. still the way it should be in 2017? Probably not. Yeah, that's what I mean. So <laughs> it's like... Probably not. It's been that way for yeah. how many years? Yeah. And yeah. It, and I know camera companies are the worst because they're the most yeah. reluctant for a change. Yeah. But we have touchscreen phones with icons and apps and all kinds of things that make it a lot easier. Why is our camera still this... This is DOS true. based system. It seems like this is true. Yeah, I, I, you know, you know what's funny. I, uh, we're we're gonna close out here. Um, and I know. And by the oh, way, for for people on the on the podcast, you, you, that'll be quick to point out. I know this brand or this particular camera. They have done it, but it's certainly not the standard. No, it's it's it, not across the board. It, it, it's not. You know, I've learned some interesting things in in this last fifty two minutes. And um, even when we talked about, you know, the, the Steve Wozniak, just the way that you think about things is um, almost three dimensional. You know, most of us think in, in one dimensional terms. I mean, people live their lives just kind of on autopilot. But I noticed um, in talking with you, you really see outside of the box as, as a constant. Like it's not something. OK, well, let me think. Well, let me think outside the box right now. You're just, it's just a part of who you are. You think that's. Uh, I never, and I don't think I'm doing it good enough. So I really, just, no, oh no, I could be doing a lot better. Oh no, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I see that your your thought process is three dimensional all the way through, and I think, you know, that was that's telling for me. You're you're always thinking about not only the left and the right, but what's in the middle and beyond. Yeah. So um, definitely, Terry, I gotta thank you, my friend. Um, thank you guys on. Let me let me uh. Terry, I got to thank you. It, this has been a great podcast. I got to tell you, this is this is going to go down in history. Uh, when, when I think of podcasts, this is always going to be the one. Um, it's no, in a place you get where Joe I started. Joe in here, that'll be oh, the one. Oh, my God. That'll man. be the one. Yes. Right. Well, you and Joe, yeah, no, I'll no, have no, like no. pillars, the here, pillars. That'll, that'll right? be the best. And, and believe me, you know, um, we we're, tr we're actually trying to get him to come out to exposure. We were going to do it in 18. Yeah, that'd be awesome. But he was, we got a, a schedule conflict, and mm -hmm. it's, the window is so tight. You know, he was like, he, you know, I'd love to do it, but. You know, there's if some one littlest thing went wrong, I mean, it would just be a total disaster. The, the, yeah. So we're trying to figure that out with him, and he's booked out of like two years. Oh, almost. I believe it. Like just yeah. crazy. So, um, let me thank you. 
I, I really well, thank appreciate you for you having me for for stopping in. I know your, your schedule was tight today, and well, I, you reached out, and it's like I, you know what? Anyone else? Oh, oh, I'm too busy, brother. but thank Keith, you. I got to make time to thank go you, visit brother. Keith. Thank you, brother. Yeah. All right. I hope you've enjoyed that podcast, and even more than that, I hope you are inspired, inspired to go out and do something great. Go out and, especially if it involves stock photography, go out and make that happen for yourself. Thank you for listening. If you're interested in following me on Twitter, it's at Keith B. Dixon. Also, subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's Everything is at Keith B. Dixon. I'm easy to find. Just at Keith B. Dixon. Facebook, Keith B. Dixon. And thank you for listening. I appreciate you tremendously. Please comment and rate this podcast. Let me know how you feel. Let me know how you like it. Be inspired. Go out and seize the day. Carpe diem.